If we look at Matthew chapter 19 there in verse number 13, Matthew chapter 19 in verse number 13, it says, uh, we have the story here, Then uh, were there brought unto him, that's unto Jesus, little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. You know, uh, there's a lot of times, many times where Jesus Christ would uh, actually uh, speak about little children uh, in many ways and forms. And here we have a situation where we have these little children, you know, wanting access to Jesus Christ. I assume the parents have said, hey, go, go and talk to Jesus. You know, go and see what Jesus has to say. And, you know, just like it is in a lot of places, you know, uh, in, in some churches, children are not allowed. You know, in some churches, they'll try to remove the children from the church, you know, because they make a bit of noise or, you know, we just heard a little baby crying just, just earlier. And for some people, they find that frustrating or whatever. But you look, when it comes to Jesus, Jesus Christ, he does not react that way at all. Amen. His disciples, these disciples are rebuking the parents for bringing the children. But Jesus Christ then says these words in verse number 14. And Jesus said, suffer, that means allow, or allow, suffer, allow little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. So you can see that Jesus Christ had time for little children. I mean, I know Jesus Christ was very busy when he walked this earth. He was casting out devils. You know, he was healing the sick. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching the word of God. But you know what? When the little children came, he had time to stop, lay his hands upon them, spend time with the children. He made sure the children knew they were important to him. And brethren, little children are important to this church, to Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Okay, and I don't, I don't say that just because I hold a bunch of them, okay? But all the children in this church are important to me, should be important to all the families here, and is definitely important to Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus Christ has also, there's another situation where we won't look at it right now, where he does speak about little children as well. And let me just give you the context of that uh, situation. You may recall when the disciples are arguing, um, arguing amongst themselves as to who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And what does God do? What does Jesus Christ do? He takes a little child and sets them there in the midst of them and says, well, if you don't humble yourself like this little, this little child, you won't even enter, you won't even see the kingdom of heaven. Okay? And so what, what Jesus Christ is speaking about there is that our way to heaven, you know, Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins. He was buried three days later. He rose again from the dead. Uh, he, he shed his blood and he paid the penalty for our sins, for the wrong that we've done. You know, what Jesus Christ is teaching us is that going to heaven isn't about your pride. It isn't about, well, I'm doing so good. Look at my good works. I live a good life. And many times when we knock on people's doors, isn't that what they say? Well, I'm a good person. I believe I should deserve to go to heaven. Well, that's not the case. In order for you to go to heaven, according to the Bible, you have to become like little children. You have to be able to humble yourself and say, you know what, God, I'm not good enough for heaven. I'm not perfect. I don't meet up to the standard of God. And I know God requires perfection. And I know perfection can only come through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for me. He rose again from the, uh, from the dead for me. And so it's just me placing my faith, my trust, my full reliance on Jesus Christ alone that will take me to heaven. And so, yeah, of course, you know, getting saved requires you to first humble yourself like a little child. So we understand that context. But when we're looking at this context, look at verse number 14 again. Christ is now speaking directly, you know, and, and literally about little children. Let's read it again, verse number 14. It says, But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me. Now, notice the next words. For of such, for of such, such what? Well, so are such little children is the kingdom of heaven. What Christ is saying, not only do we need to humble ourselves as little children to be saved, but heaven itself is made up of little children. Okay? And so the title for the sermon this morning, brethren, is Babies in the Kingdom of Heaven. Babies in the Kingdom of Heaven. Did you know little children, little toddlers, babies that perish, 100% of them are in heaven. 100% of them are in heaven, okay? And of course, we are having a special memorial service for uh, little Andrew. And, I, you know, I'm telling you, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, according to the words of Jesus Christ, that little child, that little baby is in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, and sometimes when we think about uh, past on loved ones and, you know, we, ha we have uh, memorial services or, or funeral services, you know, many times we are seeking to comfort one another, aren't we? You know, we're seeking to uh, find the comfort of the Lord. And sometimes things are said in these services for that comfort. But I'm, I'm not saying that babies are in heaven just for comfort. 
It is, it is true according to God's word. This is a fact that little children make up the kingdom of heaven. You know, little children are perishing, you know, every single day. You know, and, uh, unfortunately, a lot of mothers are doing it to their own children, things like abortions. Okay, little children per perish from miscarriages. You know, even uh, in, in this case, you know, newborn children perish. You know, there are children in other places of this world that perish just because of lack of food. You know, sicknesses and they don't have the nutrients. They don't have clean water. Little children are perishing, you know, uh, in, in, in significant numbers across this world every single day. You know what? And when they close their eyes in this earth and they open their eyes, they are with God. Amen. They are in heaven. They are in the kingdom of heaven for such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ knew this truth, of course, because it's from heaven. Okay, and that's why for him, little children are important. That question often comes up, you know, what happens to a little child that perishes? And people come up with their own, you know, ideas of what, what happens to that child. And they'll say, well, that child grew up in a, you know, was born in a Christian family, then he goes to heaven, <laughs> right? They'll have these kind of different, you know, well, if, if, if it wasn't from a Christian family, well, we don't know. Or, you know, God has this hypothetical alternative, alternate universe out there, you know, that if he did see that child grow up, he would know whether he would have believed on Christ or not. And then that's how God bases his, his judgment. That's not the case. Amen. You know, every little child goes to heaven. And, and my purpose for the sermon this morning is to first prove that to you from the Bible and then to show you the advantages that little children, little babies have to have gone to heaven before the rest of us. Okay? So, first thing I want you to uh, turn to, please, you can turn to Psalm 22 in your Bibles. Turn to Psalm 22 and verse number 9. Psalm 22 and verse number 9. Psalm 22 and verse number 9. And I know little Andrew is not here with us this morning, but what we're about to read are true for him. These are true words for him. It says in verse number 9, But thou art he that took me out of the womb, thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb, thou art my God from my mother's belly. You know what's wonderful about little Andrew? He's not here with us in his church service this morning, but he's been with us many, many Sundays. I mean, many church services. He has been here in the mother's belly, in the mother's womb. He's been here listening to God's word preached. He's been here listening to songs of praises sung about our almighty God. Listen, little Andrew's God was the God of the Bible from his mother's belly. From his mother's belly. You know, he's been hearing the words of God. He's been hearing the Bible. You know, you may remember the story where uh, when Mary, you know, uh, Jesus' mother was pregnant, that John the Baptist leaped in the womb of his mother. You know, the cousin leaped when he found out that Mary was pregnant. And so we can see here when a child is, is in, the, in the area, in the environment where uh, he's in, in church and he's with uh, a Christian family and with Christian brethren, that that child has already been here, brethren, in our church. What, 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 what an amazing blessing that little Andrew can say, Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Okay, so, you know, I, I know which God he worshipped. You know, it's the, it's the only God that he ever became aware of. You know, many of you have come from false religion. You know, I believe in something false or even a false type of Christianity. There's a lot of Christianities out there teaching you the wrong thing. Well, little Andrew is never going to be confused. He's had the right God from the very beginning. He's been hearing the Bible preached from the very beginning. And then he's gone to be with his heavenly father in heaven. What a blessing. What a blessing. I'm going to quickly read to you. We've been going through Jeremiah on Sundays, as you know. Just quickly read to you. Just a reminder in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5. Because the question becomes, well, you know, should that child have come into this world? You know, should that pregnancy have developed to to lose a child at such an early age but i i want you to notice something okay and we, we often like the idea of knowing that god has a plan for our lives you know and and i truly believe in i you know we god has a plan for us sometimes we mess up the plan but you know what when we mess up plan a god has plan b okay when we mess up plan b god has plan c for our lives okay god has a plan for our lives and let me assure you that god has a plan for all these little children that have perished. 
And I'm not saying that the plan no longer exists because they're not on this earth. No, they are seeing out their plan. Okay? So in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5, when God speaks of Jeremiah, he says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Let me read that again. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. You know what? Even before the child was conceived, God knew little Andrew's personality. He knew what plan he had in store for Andrew. You know, God was not taken by surprise when Andrew passed away. Okay? He was not taken by surprise. And then it says, And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You know what? God already had a plan, a plan A there, for Jeremiah. You, when you're born, I'm going to use you. You're going to be trained up. You're going to serve me, and you're going to become a prophet to the nations. God had a plan for Jeremiah when he was in the mother's womb, and even before he was in the mother's womb, God already had a plan for him. Let me assure you, brethren, that God has had and has a plan for Andrew as well. And all other little children that you may be familiar with, that have perished, that have gone to be with the Lord, they have a plan of God as well. God has a, has a purpose for them, brethren. Okay? God has a purpose for them. And yes, it's not going to be fully realized on this earth, but it's been realized in heaven. It's been realized in heaven. Now, I do want to show you another passage in the Bible. If you can please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. So we've seen that, you know, a, a child, you know, um, we've seen how uh, little children make up the kingdom of heaven. We've seen that when a baby is conceived in the mother's womb, and even before it's conceived, God has a plan for that child. But I just want to show you here in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this, but we do have a story of a child that after it was born, it was soon uh, it's, it soon passed away, okay? And this is the story, of course, of, of King David and the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. And the Lord decided to take that little child away that was conceived. But let's pick it up there in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 15. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 15. It says, And Nathan, that's Nathan the uh, prophet, departed unto his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. So David, knowing that God was going to take this child away, this child was going to pass on, he had become very sick, David now is seeking God, he's praying to God, he's fasting, and he's asking God, God, can you please save my little child? Verse number 17, And the elders of his house arose and went to him, to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. So the child in situation lived for a week here. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken to our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? So David's servants were so worried. Look how David's been responding. The child is, is, is passing and he's upset. He's mourning. He's seeking the Lord. And they were afraid to come and tell David that the child had passed away. They were afraid. What will David do? He's already in great anguish. Verse number 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And he came. Uh, then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. And so, brethren, what we look here in verse number 20 is the concept of what we're doing today, in a sense. We know this child has perished, but I want the family to realize that this is a very, very biblical thing to get ready to come to the house of God, as we've done today, you know, and to worship God, and then we can set some bread before us and eat. Okay, so we've had the blessing of many of you bringing a, a, a meal to share for lunch today. Okay, but we see the biblical principle here. We see the pattern taking place here. Why is David responding in such a positive manner though? Okay, um, it's still hard for him. Don't get me wrong. Okay, I'm sure he's still hurting. But you can see here, he's ready to, to move on. He's ready to, to have a positive mindset. But why is that? Why is that? Okay, well, let's keep finding out why that might be. In verse number 21, Then said his servants unto him, what thing is this that thou hast done? 
Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, so this is what David says. He says, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? So that's a good question. David's asking, listen, he's not coming back to me. He's gone. He has gone. But now then it says this, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Okay, so what do we learn there? King David, a man after God's own heart. You know, he wrote so many of the Psalms that we read about in the Bible that bring so much comfort and relief. He was able to say that, you know what, that child that has passed, he will not return to me, but I shall go to be with him. So if we know that David, a saved man, when he, when he perishes, will go to heaven, where is his child? In heaven as well. In heaven as well. This is a little infant. So the words of Jesus Christ are true. You know, the kingdom of heaven is made up of little children. Can you please turn to Romans chapter 7? Romans chapter 7, please. Romans chapter 7. I just want to give you, you know, the, the doctrine here. Understanding why is it that little children that perish go to be with the Lord? Because we know that we're all born with sin nature. Amen. We all have disobeyed God. None of us are perfect. Again, we don't deserve to go to heaven on our own. The Bible says there is none good. No, not one. It's, again, you go, to, you go door to door, talk to people. I'm a good person. The Bible says there is none good. No, not one. Okay. And again, we, we think we're good because we compare ourselves to other human beings. We may compare ourselves to murderers and rapists. We may consider, you know, compare ourselves to the worst of the worst. But when we compare ourselves to a holy God who is without sin, truly there is none good, no, not one. So the question is, well, then why is it that little children, why is it that when they perish, they go to be with the Lord? Well, the answer to this is found in Romans chapter 7 and verse number 9. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 9. Now, these are the words of the Apostle Paul. And we know that Paul, at this point, is saved. Amen. He's, he's alive. I mean, he's writing this epistle. You know, he's actually alive, of course. But so when you look at these words, we want to see what does he mean by the words we're about to read here. It says in Romans chapter 7, verse number 9, he writes, For I was alive without the law once. He says, look, there was a time when I was alive in the past. Okay. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died hold on paul what do you mean you died you're writing this epistle well he's not writing about his physical death he's writing about his spiritual death okay so spiritually he was once alive but once sin has revived once he's realized he's a sinner before an almighty holy god then he died he died spiritually okay look at verse number 10 and the commandment which was ordained to life i found to be unto death for sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Alright, so what do we learn there? We learn that when we come into this world, we are alive, spiritually alive. At some point, brethren, you know, I don't know the exact point, okay, that, that is, you know, little children are able to hear, understand the gospel at very young ages and, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But at some point, you know, and, and you know, we've all come to this realization, if you're, you know, uh, you know, an adult at least, at the very least, you know, teenagers too, you know, that, well, I, I've sinned against God. When you realize that you've sinned, that you're not perfect, that you've done wrong things, and that within you, you have this desire to sin, then you realize, boy, what's going to happen to my future? And when you realize that you've sinned against an almighty God, that's when you die spiritually, okay? And that's, you say, well, you know, that's a bit, that's a, not, not, doesn't seem right. But yeah, but that, that's when Christ has come. The Father has sent the Son to die on the cross on our behalf. So instead of us dying, you know, and, and going into an eternity of hell, we have Jesus Christ who paid the penalty of sin, and that's simply by believing on Him, by believing His death, burial, and resurrection, yes, by faith alone, not your good works. The Bible calls it a free gift. We can be made alive again. We can be born again of the Spirit, and we can be 100% sure that we will be with God in heaven. With all the little children 
that were still alive spiritually. They did not have an opportunity to die. They did not have that opportunity to come to the point of realization that they are sinners against the Lord. And this is why little children, little babies, when they perish, they go to be with God in heaven. Okay? This is why we know they are with God in heaven. All right, can you please now turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse number 20. So I've given you the doctrine, and there are other passages that I could turn to, but I hope that gives you enough thoughts and understand that the Bible is super consistent about this. You know, it's not like the Roman Catholics teach. You better get the baby sprinkled with water, you know, to escape hell. And then they, you know, hopefully they go into limbo, purgatory, and, and go from there, see what happens. That's not the case. That's not the case. All children, all children who perish go to be with the Father in heaven. Amen. Philippians chapter 1, please, verse number 20. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 20. When we think about little Andrew and his short life, and as sad as it is, and we may say that, well, in life he's not really had the opportunity to magnify the Lord. That's the language that we're going to see in this passage here. But I want you to notice verse number 20 here. Let's read it together. It says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ, and notice this, shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Whether it be by life or by death. You know, we may look at the situation and say, well, you know, it, it's a shame, it's, it's sad, you know, it, it, it's heavy burden that little Andrew has not been able to magnify the Lord in life. But listen, he has been able to magnify the Lord in death. Again, look, we've we got, we got a full house today. We've got a full church today. You know, there's, there's, there's been a, a driving desire to be in the house of the Lord this Sunday. Yes, to comfort the families. Yes. You know, to, to, to remember uh, Andrew, to bring to remembrance his life. But you know what has, has given us a full house today? It's his death. It's his death. You know, and, and here we are in the house of the Lord. We sing praises unto Him. We've had the Bible read. We're, we're preaching God's word. We are magnifying God in this house because of little Andrew. He has brought us together. And in, in death, He is magnifying the Lord. You know, in His death, it has brought uh, the, the love, you know, uh, of the brethren together. You know, the, the desire to fulfill a need and to ask the question, what is it that I can do for the family and many of you have been able to help out, you know, in, in that area, as I, I've already covered on Thursday, you know, with the burial and the funeral. Praise God. These things magnify God. And it was done through the death of a little child. The first point that I just want to bring to your attention as we go through this is that Andrew's passing has already magnified the Lord. It has already magnified the Lord. He's not missed out on that opportunity. He's already done it. He's only lived for one day, and he's already magnified the Lord. What an amazing thing. What a glorious thing. Let's keep going in that passage. Verse number 21. And look, again, these words, they're not just to comfort us. These are true words. Amen. Okay, these are true words. Verse number 21 says, for to, me, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's, that's, my, that's another way of saying profitable. You know, Paul is saying, look, it's more profitable to actually perish, to pass on, because it's so much better in heaven. Now, it's great on earth if we can live for Christ. But you know what's even better than that? What's more profitable than that is being at home in heaven with the Lord. Verse number 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am be, uh, straight betwixt two, look at this, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. <laughs> far better. You know what? The next point that I want to bring to your attention today is that babies that pass are in a far better place. A far better place. As much as we would want this child with us this morning, as much as we would want him in the church that we could look upon him and hold him, you know, and, and, and think of his life. 
Well, you know what, for little Andrew, he's in the best place he's ever going to be. Okay, and again, I don't say that just to comfort. This is what the Bible teaches us. He's having the time of his life, brethren. He's having the time of his life. He's seen what God is doing in heaven. We know that Christ went uh, to, to build uh, mansions for us. He's out there working, getting, ready, uh, getting heaven ready for those of us that will eventually go there in the future and just watching the work. You know, he may even be helping out in the work. We don't know exactly what service the Lord has for him, but remember, God did have a plan for him, okay? And that plan is being realized in, in heaven. Can you please turn to Revelation 21, please? Revelation 21 and verse number 3. Revelation 21 and verse number 3. We are fast forwarding into the future. You know, the Bible is a prophetic book. speaks about future events. And the, the period that we're looking at now is the eternal state. You know, when Christ comes back and rules and reigns, and one day God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So this is the eternal state with God. Well, that's still a future event for us. For baby Andrew, he's already in that eternal state with God. And it says here in verse number 3, Revelation 21, verse number 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And notice verse number 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. All right. So, what's the next advantage that we see? Why is it that we have? Why is it that we cry? Why is it that we weep? Why is it that we experience pain? Why is it that we experience death? Why is it that we have you know tears in our eyes, brethren? Why is it, why is that? Once again, because we live in a sin cursed, wicked world. And you know what? As we live through this world, you are going to go through different types of hardships. You are going to go through different types of burdens. You're going to be hurting uh, at different points and different families will experience different hurts uh, to other people. We are all going to shed tears. We are all going to feel pain. Okay? And it's not pleasant. It's not something we just like, you know, desire and, and enjoy necessarily, right? But you know what? There's coming a time when we're not going to have to deal with this sin-cursed world anymore. We're not going to have to deal with all this pain, suffering, all these consequences of sin. We don't have to deal with that one day, Lord, uh, you know, in the future. The third point that I want to drive home in this message is that babies that pass will never know sin. They will never know sin, nor the consequences of sin. What a blessing. Brethren, I hate it when I sin. Don't you? When you sin, you feel defiled. You know, you feel, Lord, I failed you again. And we know that we're just going to sin to the day we die. And not only the sin, knowing that we've disobeyed God and we failed God once again, but many times those sins have lasting consequences, lasting pains, lasting sorrows. You know what? Little Andrew will never experience that. He will never, he, he doesn't know what sin is. He doesn't know what the consequences of sin is. What a blessing. You know what? That's what we're looking forward to at the resurrection. The new resurrected bodies that will never sin. That's what we're desiring for. That's what the whole creation is groaning for. Little Andrew's already at there. <laughs> He's already at that place where he will not only never sin, never had the opportunity to sin or to, to face the consequences of sin. What a blessing. What a blessing for these little children that are in heaven. You're in the book of Revelation. Please turn to Revelation 22 and verse number 3. Revelation 22 and verse number 3. As I said to you when we started, you know, that God knows little children from the womb. He has a plan for them. You know, he had ordained Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations. We will never know on this earth the exact plan for uh, little Andrew, okay? But again, just because that plan is not being fulfilled on this earth, you know, we need to understand that his plan is being fulfilled in heaven right now, okay? It says here in Revelation 22, verse number 3, And there shall be no more curse, 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Brethren, when we go to be with God in heaven, when we are in that eternal state, we are still serving God. You know, you don't stop serving God in heaven. <laughs> you keep serving God, meaning God still has a work for us. He still has a job for us. He still has a purpose for us, even when we're in heaven. And again, little Andrew, you know what? His purpose, the plan that God had for him was not on this earth, brethren. He's up there in heaven, worshipping God, serving God. He's fulfilling the, the, you know, the role that God has for him right now. You know, it, it's not like, you know, uh, you know, he's missed out on something. No, he's doing the exact role that God has ordained him to fulfill in heaven. What a thought that he can be serving the Lord God right now. Because, brethren, aren't we all just, even in the, on this earth, trying to serve God right now? Amen. But again, we have the flesh. We have this sinful state. And so we fail in our service for God, don't we? You know, God, we know how God wants us to live and, and li you know, walk in accordance to His ways. And, you know, and we sin and we fail. And we know God's plans for us. And many times we don't fulfill God's plans for whatever reason. You know, and, and then we have that battle once again. The spirit versus the flesh. And the spirit wants to serve God. The spirit is willing, but the, but the flesh is weak. You know what? Little Andrew doesn't have that problem. He's fulfilling the role God has for him perfectly. He, he has no flesh to battle with. He's not going to fail in his service. We fail in our service. We fail in our faithfulness. Little Andrew's never going to fail. He's got, yeah, boy. You know, he's, he's soldiering on up there in heaven right now, serving the Lord. Never having that flesh to battle with. Never failing on the job. He's doing the exact work that God has for him. The exact service, the worship that God expects from him in heaven. So, you know what? Here's the, the fourth point that I wanted to drive there. You know, that babies that pass are fulfilling their purpose in service for God in heaven. That's an important point for you to remember. Important point for you to remember. Can you please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13. And we're going to read the very famous passage on the rapture here, the resurrection. If you're not familiar with that concept, you know, one day Christ is going to return. He's going to come back in the clouds and this old body, this sinful body will perish. It's going to be changed and God is going to give us a new resurrected body, which is like the one that the Lord Jesus Christ had when he was resurrected from the dead. Amen. Okay. This is known as the rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the word resurrection is in the Bible. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13. It says here, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, when it says here, which are asleep, he's not speaking about there are Christians that are just sleeping. You know, they're just lazy sleeping in Christians. No. When the Bible says here that those that are asleep, it's speaking about those that are saved in Christ, but have passed on. Yes, adults, of course, little children of course okay we are in a sense as believers yes the body perishes it dies but truly we will never die you know truly when the body uh, passes on it's really asleep it's waiting for a future event to come it's going to wake up the point of being asleep means that you're gonna wake up from sleep at some point okay that's the whole point of being asleep okay but and so why is Paul writing about this because it says there that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You know, the unbelieving world has no hope. They don't know what the future holds. They don't know about their loved ones. They don't know where they're going to be when they pass on. We don't have to sorrow like that. It doesn't say we should not sorrow. It just says we should not sorrow as others which have no hope. Meaning we have a hope to come. Okay, because we know when that body perishes, it's not really perished, it's asleep. Okay, it's waiting to be woken up from the dead. Because in verse number 14 it says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So those that sleep with Jesus, where are they? They're with God, because God's going to bring them with him. 
at this resurrection. Verse number 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, that's us right now, as long as we live, you know, until Christ comes back, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The word prevent there is an old English word for uh, to go before. Okay? So what the Bible is saying is here, yes, we're going to have the resurrection, those that are alive, okay? But we're not going to go before those that are asleep. Meaning those that are asleep, those that have passed on, are going to experience the resurrection of the body first. They're going to wake up first before the rest that are on the earth. Verse number 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now look at this. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. What's the comfort that we can have as Christians? We know that at the time of the resurrection, that baby Andrew is already going to be there in the clouds waiting for the rest of us okay all believers that have gone before us they're going to be ready they're going to get the resurrected body first christ comes in the clouds you know we hear the sound of the trumpet the sound the shout you know and and the believers that have died in christ they're going to be up in heaven they're going to be up in the clouds i should say and then the rest of us that remain on this earth that are believers we're going to receive our new resurrected bodies and we're going to be in the clouds with all those that have gone before us okay so the th fifth thing that I want to uh, explain to you or share in this, this sermon is that babies that pass will experience the resurrection first. First. Okay? You know, sometimes I hear Christians say, you know, I, I want to I make it to the rapture. You know, I, I don't want to miss out on the rapture. No one's missing out on the rapture. <laughs> in fact, if you, if you pass on, you get to go first. You get the resurrection body first. You know, so... You know, not to worry, you know, uh, yes, uh, the, the body, you know, of, of little Andrew will be buried this week, but it's just asleep, brethren. It's just asleep. One day, those graves are going to be open. God's going to take whatever substance is left of those bodies, you know. We, we don't want those bodies anyway. They're corrupted. They're sick. They've they got that sinful nature in them, right? God's going to give us a new resurrected body, and so shall we be together in the clouds, not only with the Lord, but all the brethren that have gone before us. And so these are comforting words, aren't they? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. As I said, the fifth thing that I want to mention today is that babies that pass will experience the resurrection first. Can you please now turn back to the book of Revelation and go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 6. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 6. Because the next thought might be, well, yes, you know, he doesn't experience uh, sin. Babies that perish will not experience sin and um, they will be resurrected so they're not going to miss out on that body, you know, that new perfect body to come. Uh, but, you know, it, the thought might be, you know, well, it, it would have been nice if they just had an opportunity to be on the earth and, and lived longer lives and, and lived out their lives, okay? The truth of the matter is, they're still going to experience this earth. Okay? In Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 6, Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection. We just read about that. Okay? So that's all believers. On such the second death, the second death is the lake of fire, by the way, hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Brethren, what, what the, what's the average lifespan for a, for a man these days? I think, I think worldwide it's like 75. I think in Australia the average lifespan is about 85. We have a longer lifespan than most of the other uh, world. Okay? That might seem like a long life in comparison to one day. It might seem long. But what about a thousand years? <laughs> I mean, what, what's 85 years in comparison to a thousand years? Okay? What is the promise here? The promise here... Little Andrew's not going to miss out on the earth. Okay? He's going to walk this earth. He hasn't missed out as an opportunity. He's going to be on this earth for Christ comes back. We have our new resurrected bodies. We have that first resurrection. We are going to rule and reign with him, with Christ, a thousand years. 
Now, what's even better than that? But, you know, yes, he's going to experience the earth, but what's even better? He's not going to experience a wicked earth. He's not going to experience unjust governments and unjust laws. He's not going to experience laws that are against the word of God. He's not going to experience this wicked, sinful lifestyles that we have to put up with in this earth. When he comes back to this earth, the whole earth is going to be submissive to the Lord of God. Submissive to Jesus Christ as King over the entire earth. So brethren, the, the sixth thing that I want to bring to this sermon is that babies that pass will only know the earth as submissive to Christ. Boy, that's what I want. I want this whole I want our nation to be submissive to Christ. I want our nation to have fear of God at least. You know, I, I want our governments to take up God's word and to build laws built on God's word and to stick their nose at the businesses that are not theirs. I want that. I get frustrated with the wicked world we live in, brethren. You know, I want to see, you know, proper justice and judgment for the wicked out there, the pedophiles and all the, all the kind of filth that's in the world. I want to see justice Amen. done. You know what? And, and we get frustrated when we see people with a slap on the wrist for, for major crimes, for major sinful things that God has greater punishment for. Amen. We get frustrated at the earth. You know what? Andrew, when he's here ruling reign for a thousand years, he's going to see a world run under godly laws, under a godly rule, Christ reigning on this earth, and he's going to be reigning with him for a thousand years. So he's not missed out on this earth. He's going to experience the earth in a much better shape than, than we've experienced these 70, 80 years, if we're lucky, to live that life, you know, to live that long. If we're blessed, I should say, to live that long. And so babies that pass will only know the earth as submissive to Christ. Can you please turn to Hebrews chapter 12 for me? Hebrews chapter 12. I hope you see as we go through the sermon that as sad as it is, family, and I know the rest of us share in that grief, that for Andrew, boy, he's got a good He's very blessed. He's very blessed. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and Hebrews chapter 12 follows on obviously from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the chapter of the hall of faith, very famous chapter. You know, so it goes through uh, very, uh, uh, it goes through different uh, Bible. Yes, men and women in the Bible that were uh, faithful to God and, and they were able to accomplish great things uh, because of their faith from the Lord God. And so we have this, this list of, of uh, believers there in, in Hebrews chapter 11. And then we pick it up there in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. And it says here, Wherefore seen, we also, we also, this is now about us, are compassed, that means surrounded, about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Hmm, that's interesting. You know, the Bible's teaching us here, and th those witnesses, of course, are the, are, the, are the people that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. So it's mentioning believers, saints that have gone before us, they've perished, they're in heaven. Okay? The Bible's telling us here that we believers today on this earth are compassed, we're surrounded by this so great cloud of witnesses that were mentioned there in Hebrews 11. But again, in the greater context, all the believers that have gone to be with God. What does that mean? Well, let's have a keep going. It says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know what? The spiritual life is like, I guess, think about the Olympics or something, right? Where you might have a 100-meter like sprint or something like that. Maybe it's more of a marathon. The Christian life is more like a marathon than a sprint, really. Okay? And so you've got this great cloud of witnesses. You've got you know, these people you know, cheering on. Yeah, you know, run, run hard. Yeah, keep going, keep going, right? Cross the line. We kind of have that idea when we see things like you know, athletics and, and Olympics, things like that. Well, in the spiritual realm, there's something very similar as well. You know what? God has set a race before us and is asking us to run that spiritual race. You know, to, to live a life that is pleasing to God. Okay? To live a holy and righteous life. But the Bible tells us here that we have these witnesses, these that have gone before us, watching the race. Watching the race. And so the reason I wanted to bring this to your attention is because, you know, little Andrew is watching our race. 
the levers that have gone before us are witnesses watching our race. I, I want you to run a good race. And I, and I say this to the family that, who are hurting, run the race that God has set before you. You have an extra person in the grandstand cheering you on, saying, run that race. Serve God with your life here on this earth. We have this cloud of witnesses. Look at verse number two. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him and due with the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The seventh point that I wanted to bring to this sermon is that babies that pass are watching and cheering your spiritual race. So I hope that makes you want to like run harder, <laughs> run faster, you know, looking onto Jesus and say, you know what, I'm going to make sure that my life is, is one that serves Christ. I want to make sure my life is one that reflects Jesus Christ because I've got loved ones, I've got little children, I've got these, these great men in Hebrews chapter 11, all part of these witnesses, all sitting there in the grandstand cheering us on to run this race. I want Blessed Hope Baptist Church to win the race. I want us to attain the, the prizes, the crowns that God has in store for us. Can you please turn to Romans chapter 7? Romans chapter 7 and verse number 14. Romans chapter 7, verse number 14. You know, I've had people say to me, but I don't want these witnesses watching my race because I mess up. But what about when I sin? What about when I do wrong? I don't want these witnesses watching me, right? I mean, I think that's a legitimate concern, okay? But one thing you need to understand, when, you're, when you've done wrong, when you've made mistakes, when you've sinned against the Lord, you're not running the race at that point in time. These witnesses are watching the race, okay? Now, if you pull out of the race briefly, momentarily, you know, and have done something wrong, those witnesses aren't watching your race at that point in time. You're not racing. You're not racing, Okay? Don't forget that within man, as a saved person, don't forget the dual nature that we have within us. The flesh and the spirit. Listen, the flesh of man is not running the race. It's running its own race. Okay? It's doing whatever it wants. Okay? But we have the new man. We have the spirit of God within us. Remember, the spirit is willing. The spirit is the one that wants to run the race. But the flesh is weak. Okay? So keep that in mind. When those witnesses are watching our race, they're only watching... The, the righteous works that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 7, verse number 14. Romans 7, 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Then he says this, But I am carnal, sold under sin. What does the word carnal mean? Well, it means, fle it means fleshly. Get your flesh. Carnal. You know? Verse number 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now, this is the Apostle Paul, who God used to write many epistles in the New Testament. Okay? And he says he is carnal. He says he does things that he hates. And that's what we do, brethren, when we sin against the Lord. We, you know, the new man within us hates it. Because we're not running the race, are we? We're only running the race if we put on the new man. If we live and walk after the Spirit. Verse number 16. Uh, verse number, sorry. Uh, yeah, 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good, that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin dwelleth in me. So you know what? When you sin, it's not really you. Because the real you is the new man, the spiritual man that has been born of God. Okay? The flesh does it. That flesh is going to perish anyway. Okay? Verse number 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. For to will, the Spirit is willing, remember? But how to perform that which is good, I find not. So the reason I'm just reading that to you, Reverend, just to remind you that dual nature that we have. The flesh. There's no good in that flesh. Okay? But when it sins, it's not really us that do it. Okay? Because the new man... The soul that has been saved is sinless. Okay? The Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, that's God's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, brethren, this flesh 
was not born of God. This flesh was born of my parents, all the way from Adam and Eve. Okay, But the new man, the spiritual man that is within us, that is born of God. And that which is born of God doth not commit sin. Okay, So the reason I read that to you is to remind you that we're running a race. Okay, And I believe, you know, the reason I wanted to end on this is because I strongly believe, you know, biblically speaking, from the Bible, that little Andrew's there cheering us on, Okay, say so what would Andrew want us to do right now? He would want us to run the race. Okay, he would want us to put off this flesh, this carnal nature that we have, that battle that we battle with, and he wants us to walk in the new man. He wants us to live after Christ, and then he wants to cheer us on as we run that race. I want that to be a reminder to the parents that babies that pass are watching and cheering on your spiritual race. So, brethren, in conclusion. You know, I titled this sermon, Babies in the Kingdom of Heaven. I hope I've proven to you that little pe- children that perish are in heaven, without a doubt. Okay? And let me just quickly remind you of the seven points that we looked at today. Number one, their passing magnifies the Lord. Number two, they're in a far better place. Number three, they will never know sin, nor the consequences of sin. Number four, they are fulfilling their purpose of ser- serving God in heaven. Number five, they will be the first to experience the resurrection. Number six, they will only know the earth as one that is submissive to Christ. And number seven, they are watching and cheering us on in the spiritual race. Okay, let's pray.